I sort of, when it comes to these nutters, I'm always sat here that, you know, they were, they were probably quite, most of them were probably normal people at one point in their life, right? And then they just snapped one day. Because I bet you thought, I bet everyone in, their, in this room can think of one personal, one personal example from their own life of one person you knew who was a perfectly reasonable, decent human being, and then one day they woke up and went, oh, fuck this. I'm going to be a nutter for the rest of my fucking life, right? It's going to be a massive shit. I don't fucking care anymore, right? Fuck it, right? And I thought, and I start thinking, well, I wonder if that's going to happen to me. Am I just going to fucking wake up one day, or I'm just going to walk, am I just one day for no reason just going to snap and go, and I'm going to suddenly be one of these fuckers, right? And then I remembered, as I was thinking that, I realised I almost fucking did, right? And I'm going to end the show tonight, I'm going to tell you the true story of how I nearly became a nutter. <laughs> I hate the fact that people always laugh at that bit, right? <laughs> Fuck you. Now, the, um, now, I've got to tell you, this is a true story I'm going to tell you. I'm not proud of it, it gets a bit grim in places, but it's a true story. Okay, uh, let's move, let's, let's go on. Now, let me give you some geography of the story, right? Uh, it's 2005, I'm living in Winchester, which is just down the road from here. Right? Uh, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> just cheer as you come in, thank you very much. Right? I'm living in Winchester, right? And uh, I'm going out of a girl. Yeah, no, a girl. Seriously, right? <laughs> fucking serious, right? There was a girl, right? Some of you just lost a five a bit with your mate there, up there, right now. <laughs> he fucking wasn't. No, he, yeah, he was, right? I'm, I'm, I'm in Winchester, and I'm going out with this girl who lives in South East Gate in Faversham. So we're about five, uh, so we're about, we're about uh, 120 miles apart, right? We're about 120 miles apart, right? Now, we've been going out a few days. We used to see each other week by week. We'd alternate when she, she'd come for two days. Uh, well, she'd visit for two days. She wouldn't come. That would be... Not, I'm not an animal, right? Okay, so she'd visit, she'd visit for two days, and then I'd visit her for two days, and then vice versa, vice versa, right now, okay? And it's going well. The relationship's going well, right? It's a you know, solid, no great big plans for the future, but it's a solid relationship. And then one day, I'm in Winchester, it's 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday, she's in Faversham, <coughs> she rings me up on the phone, and she gives me some news, some very bad news. She says, Richard, I'm pregnant. Now, I didn't need to hear that. I said, don't fucking clap for that. <laughs> Listen, mate, this show's called Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus. You might be able to work out how this story ends, right? <laughs> you won't be clapping by the end, right? So, you know. Now, this is the thing, right? I don't want to fucking look after a child. I'm fucking, I'm scared shitless now. Big chills, goddamn this bowel, back bowels have loosened up. I'm fucked, right? Because it took me, once it took me half an hour to find the cue on my keypad on my laptop. I don't fucking need a human being to fucking look after on top of that. you ever done that? You're like, it was here yesterday. There was a fucking queue here. Right, let's go start. <laughs> JS1. Now, you just go with it, right? So I don't need another human being. But fortunately, before I had to express my fucking concern, my girlfriend said, I don't want to have this kid. And I was like, yes! Right? I, well, I didn't do that out loud, right? I mean, <laughs> kept that very much inside my own self, right? I played it down, though, right? But I, she's got to, we're going to say, right, okay, we're going to terminate the pregnancy. But here's the problem. We have to wait four weeks, right? Now, for that four-week period, I don't want to make out that what I was going through was anything as bad as what she was going through, obviously. But what I was going through was every day for that four-week period, all I could think was, please don't fucking change your mind. <laughs> please do not fucking change your mind. Don't phone me up one day with that fucking phone call. I don't want to fucking hear this, right? I'm scared shit myself every time the phone rings. Don't change your fucking mind, right? Now, the thing was, when it comes to abortion, I've always been pro-choice. That's always been my position. I'm sure many people here have that position or whatever. Uh, but my position has always been pro-choice. And I always thought I knew what that meant. It meant abortion is the woman's right to choose. Her body, her choice. That was until my girlfriend got pregnant. <laughs> and then suddenly the choice, pro-choice suddenly became, right, here are your choices, darling. The doctor does it, or I'm going to fucking do it, okay? This is what... <laughs> This is how it fucking works. Okay? You go to the medical centre where it's safe and the professionals can do it, or there's going to be a strategically placed roller skate at the top of the stairs at three in the fucking morning. I'm setting off the fire alarm, there's a bath full of gin and coat hangers downstairs. What do you fucking want? Okay? I didn't put it quite like that. I should have coated it somewhat, right? Okay, but... Got to be firm, right? Now, fortunately, fortunately, there was one. In, unfortunately, there was one incident where we did have to deal with a bunch of anti-abortion pro-life wankers. Right? We had to go to the clinic. We had to go to the clinic once a week, and on the second week we went. As we're leaving, there's a bunch of these fucking gormous looking fuckers with their stupid fucking folk festival jumpers and glasses on, right? Old Charlie, then the people who shout at women who leave these clinics and go murder, murder, being led by this dog-collared fucktard. 
right, who was there, right? And, I'm, and he starts har- they start harassing my girlfriends. I'm not going to stand for that. So I stood up to the bugger and started, like, getting in his face about it, right? And we're going back and forth, and I realise this is futile. And I find out this guy's a Catholic priest, right? So I said to him, right, as a Catholic priest, the only reason you are against abortion is because when you see a picture of an aborted fetus, you think, oh, I could have been molesting that in seven years' time. <laughs> Throw that one in at Christmas dinner, surprise your name. Now, the, uh, <laughs> I want to make this clear now. Because people think, because I've written a comedy show, uh, I've written a comedy routine about this, that this was funny to me. It wasn't. It was not funny in the sight. It was one of the most traumatic, stressful, upsetting, emotionally draining four weeks of my fucking life. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone as a Debenhams Red Letter Day special, okay? It's not. It wasn't fun, right? And the problem with it, though, the problem with this is the reason it's not, because it, you're going through it, you don't feel you can talk to anyone about it. You don't feel you can actually get this off your chest with anyone. You don't feel you can express, because there's it, no matter how cool and groovy we are about abortion, the fact of the matter is, there's this black cloud that hangs over abortion. Whenever you bring it into a conversation, whenever you mention it, and there's this tension that fucking just rises, and you don't feel you can get, you don't feel like you deserve sympathy from anyone, right? And because of that, <coughs> you don't you don't know how to talk to anyone. And because of that, nobody fucking knows how to talk to you. Right? Not even the professionals at the medical centre knew how to deal with it. And the week before, the week before she's due to have the abortion, on a Friday, we went into the centre, and she has to have an ultrasound, one of the scans, right? I don't know why, they had to make sure the baby was healthy before we killed it, right, okay? (laughs) Because my taxes are going into this, what my fucking money's worth, right? I don't want to spaz, right, okay? I don't want to just be killing some cripple, it'll be a waste of time, right? Okay. <laughs> On the full fucking Christmas dinner. Now, so here we go. So she's doing the scan, the nurse, right? She's doing the scan, right? Does the scan, everything's fine. Then she prints off a copy of the scan, leans over to me and goes, Would you like to keep that, sir? <laughs> what? <laughs> Would you like to keep the copy of the scan? No! <laughs> of course I don't want to keep it, you stupid fucking cow. Why would I want... I don't want to keep the thing that it's a copy of. Why do I want... <laughs> this is not a fucking Kodak moment for us here, darling, is it? This ain't like the fucking Generation game where you get a cuddly toy and I get a fucking big prize at the bloody end, right? What am I going to do with this exactly? What did you think was my plan? I'm going to go, oh yes, we'll put this in the photo album. We'll, we'll reminisce about this in years to come. Oh, darling, do you remember when we killed our unborn child? And, oh, Corky, what would he have grown up to be, right? What am I supposed to torture my parents with this one? Give it to my mum. So there you are, mum. There's the grandchild you're never going to fucking get, okay? Because I'm an irresponsible cunt, right? Don't buy him any clothes, he won't grow into them, right? (laughs) If if you went for a mastectomy, they wouldn't give you a ticket and a presentation case to take home with you, would they? Here's your bollocks on a plinth. Well done for surviving cancer, sir, right? They wouldn't do that. If you're going to be this insensitive about it, why don't you go to the full hall, put the fetus in a jar and make us wear it around our neck like a sort of perverted version of Flavor Flav from Public Enemy. We can march down the street and people can throw raw tomatoes at us and fucking pelts and shout abuse. Bollocks, put an abortion gift shop at the fucking end of the clinic as you're on your way out. Like the fairground when you go on a roller coaster. Get your scan, put on a t-shirt under the phrase, better luck next time, Junior. <laughs> Now, because of this, I was asked never to return to this abortion clinic ever again. (laughs) I've never been barred from a pub in my life, right? I get banned from going to an abortion clinic, right? Now, because of this, I was not allowed to go the following week to my girlfriend when she had to, with my girlfriend when she had to go through the procedure. Do you know how much of a wanker that makes you feel? You can't even be there for the aborting of your unborn child, right? It's fucking makes you feel pathetic, right? So I, I, I've fucked up completely now, right? Because I've genuinely lost the shit with the nurse, right? So I've now gone, I'm now fucking back in Winchester, right? It's the week she's about to have the abortion, right? And I'm there, it's a Monday, right? She's having it on a Friday, I'm at work on a Monday. And I can't take it anymore, and I have a nervous breakdown at fucking work, okay? I just collapse on the floor in a, be- in a big puddle of snot, tears and wailing, right? Just collapse on the fucking floor. And my work legally had to send me home on a week's paid leave, which I didn't know they had to do, so I've done it three or four more times since then. <laughs> <laughs> if you take nothing else from this show, and you won't, right, fucking take that with you. There's our little gift to you. If you want a week off work, just fucking start crying, right? They're taking an onion with your work, right? <laughs> so they sent me home. 
and now it's even worse. Now it's even worse. Now I'm at home on my own, sat there. Now, the one thing I used to do to try and take my mind off things in my free time, in my spare time, one thing I used to do was I was really into science as a kid, right? And I got into chemistry when I was a teenager, right? And so I, I used to do chemistry all the fucking time. All the time when I was like, spare time, any time I had holidays or work, I was always mucking around with chemistry. I got to the point where I was actually a professional level uh, chemist, right? Now, my friends used to call me a junkie, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> But that's politically incorrect and offensive, right? So I used to call myself a chemist, right? Now, so I, now this week's a stressful week. I've got to do some serious fucking chemistry to get through this fucking week, okay? So I phone up my mate Wayne. Fucking, that's a name you can trust when you want to get hold of some chemicals, right? So I phone Wayne up. Wayne's there in my house within an hour with 35 grams of uncut methamphetamine. That'll do for me nicely. Right? So the week fucking flies by. I'm shoveling that in. It's great. Right? I fucking might take my mind off it. Everything goes right. But now it's the Friday morning. It's like Friday morning about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And I've run out of drugs. And they're starting to wear off. Right? And I've been awake for 127 hours at this point. Right? And the drugs are starting to wear off. And it's the day of the abortion. And all I wanted to do was I wanted to not have to cry. That was the one thing I wanted to talk. I'm not going to do this for anyone. I'm just going to do it for myself. I don't want to fucking cry. One minute past midnight, I can cry my fucking eyes out. Not now, right? Not today. But I've been awake for 127 hours. If you've ever been awake for a long period of time, you know the littlest thing can fucking set you off. I nearly burst into tears at one point. A pen leaked in my pocket. I thought I had a varicose vein. I thought, fuck, right? <laughs> So I thought, right, I've got to try and get out. I've got to try and stop myself from crying. What can I do? I can feel the emotion bubbling up right there. I don't want to fucking let it get, me, get the better of me. So what can I do? So I'm trying to think logically, but my brain's not thinking very logically. Okay? So I'm thinking, right, what can I do to stop me from going, right, okay. I know. I'll go to Tesco's. <laughs> because I've never seen anyone cry in Tesco's. <laughs> So there must be something about Tesco's that stops you fucking crying. Brilliant, right. It's open 24 hours, I'll go there, thanks for that mate. Right. It's open 24 hours, I'll go there and I'll stay there till midnight, right, okay? So, Tesco's is only about half a mile down the fucking road. But the problem with Tesco's is like, it's, I, I've been away for so long doing the old dressage walk down there fucking, and I can't get down, I can't walk there too quickly. By the time I get to Tesco's, it's 11.30. I knew it was 11.30 because there's a big clock above the entrance of Tesco's, right, in Winchester. It's 11.30. So I walk in to Tesco's, right? I walk in and I, my watch said 11.30 as I'm walking in. My phone, which I had checked, said 11.30. It's 11.30, right? I walk into Tesco's. The next thing I fucking remember, I'm halfway down the fruit and veg aisle, staring longingly at an aubergine in my left hand. <laughs> and I look at my clock and it says quarter past 12. And I don't know how I fucking got here. And I thought, obviously there's been a rip in the space-time continuum. I have leapt forward into the future. And I thought, no, that's silly. What's more likely to have happened, and in fact what actually had happened, was as I walked into Tesco's, my sleep-deprived bl brain blacked out. Right? And I slept-walked instinctively down the fruit and veg aisle to the aubergines, picked one up, and I've now been standing there staring at it for three quarters of an hour. <laughs> and I knew that was the case, because there was a load of, like, three or four members of staff from Tesco sort of hanging around behind me going... <laughs> so I thought, I've got to get out of this with some fucking dignity, so I just went... Yep, yeah, that's the fucking aubergine for me. That's the one right there. You've got to check these things thoroughly, mate. You've got to fucking... You've got to... Have you seen Panorama? Terrorists put anthrax in these. You've got to hold them to the light, right? Okay. I've got my fucking aubergine. So I'm going down... I'm, I'm like Neville Chamberlain marching down the fucking bit with the aubergine in the fucking head. I get to the end. I get to the end of the fruit and veg aisle and I get this almighty crippling pain in my stomach. It's fucking unbearable. It's not like a twinge. It's like... It, just, it hits me instantly. I'm just like... Oh! Oh, fuck! Oh! Oh, Jesus fucking Christ! Oh, fuck! Everyone behind me scatters because they're thinking two dozen aubergines are about to fly out of this bloke's arse, right? He's <laughs> clearly going for the Guinness World Record with like, aubergines in one rectum, right? So I'm suddenly going, oh, fucking hell, what is this pain? What is this? It's fucking, oh, God, I can't stand this, right? And I, and I remember, hold on, it's quarter past twelve. 
that's the same time as my girlfriend's appointment to have her abortion. It's the exact moment. And the exact moment when she is 120 miles away, undergoing a medical procedure that is causing her great pain and discomfort in her womb, I am 120 miles away in Winchester, in Tesco's, experiencing a great deal of pain in where my womb would be if I had one, right? So this is freaking me out quite spectacularly at this point. I'm really fucking scared. Now, I'm not a religious man. I'm not a holy man or a spiritual man. You might have fucking figured that out from this uh, right, show. But I'm sat there, I'm, th- I'm having a crisis of faith here in Tesco's, right? I'm thinking, whatever's doing this, this can't be a coincidence. It cannot be a coincidence. Whatever's doing this, it must be some higher power. Let's call it God, right? And God is punishing me right here, right now. He's sending me a message for me being irresponsible with life because only he gets to give life and take it away, not me. And he's punishing me for the pain and the misery and the suffering that I have caused. And I'm starting to freak out and I don't want to be the first guy to cry in Tesco's. So I've got to get out of here right fucking now. But I've got to pay for my own regime first, okay? So, <laughs> Don't fucking lot. I've got to pay for it, haven't I? I've just stood there looking at it for 45 fucking minutes. If I go put it back and walk out, I'll be right loony, wouldn't I, right? So I get to the fucking checkout, and there's only one guy in front of me, right? And I'm fucking, forget holding in the tears. It's at the fucking, it's the point of no return. I'm there, you know when you're just trying to hold it in, I'm just like... <laughs> Guy in front of me goes away, checkout girl, next please. <laughs> checkout girl, 17 years old, her name was Stacy, best fucking checkout girl I've ever seen in my life, right? Didn't bat an eyelid, didn't flinch, professional, thick as pig shit really, borderline psychopathic, I'm being like, no ability to read human emotions or understand the reality of the world around her, and I needed that, I needed someone who was not too clued in and figuring out what kind of stress I was under at that point because I wanted to get the fuck out of there really quickly, right? So she goes to the the aubergine, sir. She bristles the fucking thing out of me, had a vice-like grip on it, I'm just stood there trembling, I can't lie. <laughs> she does it, she does a touch in a 4,000 digit code for aubergine, puts it in a bag, and she looks at me and goes, Do you have a Tesco Club Points card, sir? <laughs> yes, I do. Because <laughs> I did. Right? And I could have just said no, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to get something out of fucking today. I'm going to be a winner at something, right? So fuck you. I'm going to get some. I'm going to be a well, fucking uh, I'm going to get my 170th of a fucking Tesco club point on my aubergine, right? Fuck you, right? So I've got my wallet out of this. So, uh... It's not there. It's not fucking there. And then I remembered, you know where it was? I was at home, I'd left it, I was doing that to cut up all the fucking drugs, I was sticking up my fucking Uber all fucking week. And that was the straw that broke the fucking camel's back for me! <laughs> this on top of a dead baby, no one can handle that in one fucking day! So I just fucking went nuclear, biblical fucking meltdown! Fucking threw my wallet in the air, bus tickets and change go flying everywhere, and I go, <laughs> <laughs> and then the stabbing pains came back in my stomach, but they were ten times fucking worse this time. Like, uh, I've turned into a death metal lead singer. <laughs> And this voice in my head goes, right Rich, this is fucking it. This is the moment where you've got to turn your fucking life around, right? You've lived a life of debauched, depraved decadence. You've been irresponsible, nihilistic and immoral, right? And now you're fucking paying for it. Whatever's causing this pain in your stomach, it's God. And he's pissed at you right now. You, he's pissed off at you for fucking around and now you've got to turn your fucking life around. The only way you can stop this, the only way you can get things better is you've got to get on your fucking knees right here, right now, and you've got to beg God for fucking forgiveness. So right there, check out six, 25 minutes past 12, in Tesco's, I'm there, drop to my knees, everyone looking at me and I go, OH GOD! Why have thou forsaken me? I'm sorry! Okay, asshole, I'm sorry! But then, 
the pain went away instantly. And I thought, this warm, fuzzy feeling is coming through me. I was like, I've fucking done it. He's let me off. Oh, fucking thank you, thank you, thank you, God, thank you. Thank you, dear, that's it. I'm, I'm a changed man now. No more divorce, decadent depravity. No more fucking drugs, sex. No more alcohol, no more heavy metal music. No, from now on, I'm a changed man. I'm working for the Lord now. I'm going to go forth. I'm going to travel the land. I'm going to go forth and I'm going to tell people, if you're in pain, if you're sad, if you're miserable, you can get right with God, you can feel better. All you've got to do is get on your knees and beg God for forgiveness. And if you mean it, he'll forgive you because he loves you. Right? I am now a servant of the Lord. <laughs> Unfortunately, as quickly as this life-changing theological revelation came to me, it quickly disappeared. Because I realised something. As I dropped to my knees, I shit myself. <laughs> and then I realised, oh fuck, I've been on methamphetamine. Methamphetamine makes you constipated. I haven't had a poo for five fucking days. And it just so happened to be wearing off at the exact same time as my girlfriend's abortion appointment. And that's when the poo started kicking in, right? It was a massive coincidence. And as I've dropped to my knees, it's all come flooding out, right? I'm shaking, I'm trembling. And I don't know what the quickest conversion to deconversion is of any religion. I fucking shattered it that fucking day. Nothing will make you believe that there is no God with a divine plan than when you find yourselves on your knees in Tesco's with your arms in the air and your pants filled with duty. And for some fucking reason, when you crap yourself in public, it always smells ten times fucking worse than it does when you're at fucking home, right? So I'm now stuck there and I'm going, I don't know, I'm gonna, I can't get out of this. <laughs> There's no way I can get out of this really deeply. I'm fucked, bro. I'm fucked, what am I going to do? You're an idiot, right? And time had just frozen. I don't know like, how long I was there. I could have been there 10 hours, 30 seconds. But it was broken by Stacy. Bless her. She saw me on the floor. She leant over with a bit of paper in her hand. And she looked at me and said, Would you like an application form for a Tesco club card, sir? <laughs> Which I took, because they never had any toilet paper in that Tesco's, and I didn't end up travelling the world telling people to get right with Jesus. I just went around the world now telling people the story of how I nearly went mental enough to go around the world telling people to get right with Jesus. If there's any moral you can take from this, it's if you're in a bad way, just take some drugs and don't leave the fucking house, okay? That's all I can offer you. Have you had a good time, folks? Yeah. <laughs>